My name is Brian Hoke and I'm a member of the Vasily Think Tank and in the next few minutes I'm going to go through the assessment of the pest cavus foot type which has a more supinatory pattern as opposed to the more typical pronatory pattern of the foot. We'll go through the assessment of this foot type. We will also go through the more common problems that they encounter as well as the treatment intervention using the new Vasily Hoke orthotic device. The pest cavus foot type is one that is typically going to be identified by the clinician as having a much higher medial longitudinal arch. And this is due to a number of structural factors, uh, which we will get into as we go through the in actual individual assessment itself. In the first part of the assessment, we're going to take a simple inspection of the lateral border of the foot. Uh, and in the pest cavus foot, there will often be a much lower forefoot to rear foot plane, meaning that the forefoot is actually plantar flexed or in an equinus attitude relative to the heel. The next uh, assessment that we would perform on this client has to do with their mobility at the ankle joint. And to do this, keeping them in a slightly supinated position, we would then have them dorsiflex and see how much of the equinus influence of the calf we can reduce. The next thing we're going to assess is the mobility of the midfoot region. So in this assessment, we're going to stabilize the rear foot push the rear foot into a more pronated position and then assess the mobility of the forefoot. In a mobile forefoot, we're able to fully reduce the forefoot equinus. In the more rigid foot, you will meet stiff resistance and you'll see a lack of mobility along the oblique axis of the mid-tarsal joint. So the next thing we're going to look for is uh, the position of the foot with regards to the alignment of the vertical bisection of the leg. In the pest cavus foot, the forefoot is typically more adducted towards the midline, making the base of the fifth metatarsal much more prominent. We would again assess the mobility of the foot uh, with regards to this adduction through assessment of midfoot mobility, which we discussed just a moment earlier. Um, again, this midfoot mobility is quite good. In the more rigid, stiff foot, we would encounter significant resistance to this motion. The next assessment technique that I would go through is an assessment of the position of the first metatarsal relative to the lesser digits. So we're going to place our thumb against the metatarsal heads, first on the lesser digits and then subsequently under the first metatarsal. And in this foot type, which you can see um, demonstrated well by the model here, we have a plantar flex position where the first metatarsal is actually lower than the second. The next thing we would check in this position is the mobility of that segment by simply applying a dorsal and in, an inversion glide followed by a plantar flexion eversion glide to see the mobility of the segment. Um, in the more rigid foot type, there will be a very little mobility present in this plantar flex first ray position. The next thing that we would see uh, in this assessment is uh, that there would typically be more callus development under that first metatarsal, which is actually plantar flexed relative to its neighbor. So very common to see a callus pattern where we have excessive callus on the first and fifth metatarsal heads, and sometimes even going back as far as the base of the fifth metatarsal head. Our next assessment will be the mobility of the rear foot, the subtalar joint uh, in particular. And to do this, we get a reference point on the leg. You can see I've drawn a, a, a bisection on the central portion of the leg as well as another bisection on the heel. We'll then take the foot through normal subtalar triplane motion where we're everting, but with a component of abduction. And in the mobile foot, we have subtalar joint pronation available. Um, this foot will typically begin in a varus position and in the stiff rigid foot that may not respond as well to correction, you cannot really reduce that inverted position, meaning that there's actually a restriction of eversion available. So it is very important for the clinician to try to make sure that the subtalar joint will move out of its varus position into a more everted posture. So we find Taylor congruity, putting the subtalar joint in neutral. Then we compare the attitude of the rear foot to the leg, but more importantly in this particular foot type is the plane of the metatarsals relative to the rear foot. As you can see, with the forefoot valgus foot type, the plane of the metatarsals is actually everted away from the midline, giving the first metatarsal the first primary point of contact with the ground. 
Our next test is called the block test. You can see the heel in a very inverted posture here, and we want to see the effect of relieving the first ray position. So we'll take a small book, about uh, 5 to 10 uh, millimeters in thickness, place that under the forefoot so that the edge of the book is going between the first and second toes. The patient then relaxes, allowing the first metatarsal to drop off the edge of the book, and now we can see the rear foot assume a much more vertical posture, and this is a very positive indicator that correction of the forefoot will result in a much better subtalar position. Our next test is, is the navicular drop test. So this is a quantitative measurement of arch mobility. So the first thing we do is position the foot directly under the knee. Then we're going to be marking the navicular tuberosity in the medial longitudinal arch. We now go to the mark that we've made on the navicular tuberosity and place a piece of relatively um, rigid cardboard or folded over paper against the vertical line and extend the horizontal line to get a starting position for the navicular height. The patient will then stand. And in a mobile foot type, we'll see a significant movement of the arch. Uh, typically would be more than eight millimeters for a hypermobile foot. The average for a normal foot somewhere around six to eight millimeters. In the rigid foot, when we start in the same position and extend that mark and then have them stand, we see very little movement of the mark, perhaps only a millimeter or two, indicating that there is very little mobility in the arch area. With this uh, high arch foot type, the first ray is typically in a plantar flex position, which can create problems of its own, but actually does create slack within the plantar fascia, allowing rather free dorsiflexion of the hallux when we pull it up passively. If the foot was in a more pronated posture, as we sometimes see, that actually puts a great amount of tension on the plantar fascia, and that test would be very positive, and we would not be able to clear the hallux off the supporting surface. The pest cavus foot type can present with a myriad of pathological problems. These begin with simply the rigidity of the foot causing shock, which is both absorbed within the foot and can create some rather uh, painful conditions with regards to midfoot arthritic changes, as well as shock going up the lower extremity, causing pain or stress fractures in the shin, as well as things going proximally even up into the pelvic girdle and back, causing low back pain. Within the foot itself, this can also uh, result in overload to the plantar flex first metatarsal, creating sesamoiditis of the small bones beneath the first metatarsal, as well as stress to the soft tissues which control this supinated posture. As the foot moves towards supination, the muscles on the outside of the foot are forced to resist that and decelerate that motion. So this foot often presents with ankle instability ankle sprains, recurrent ankle sprains, as well as tendonitis of the muscles that course around the malleolus, the peroneus longus and brevis, causing chronic tendonitis type problems to those particular tendons. In the past few minutes, we've been able to go through the assessment of the foot, a little bit of a discussion of the type of uh, injuries that this foot encounters in common daily activities, as well as an intervention that may be helpful to manage this foot's medical conditions. We hope that you'll find this helpful in managing the supinatory pescavus foot type.